I don't think we actually talked about the organization itself. We talked about uh, tax exempt status, which is really important. We talked about some of the control, like through the propaganda control of what's out there. It's actually interesting that you said that, like, uh, Scientology has pretty much lost the battle with the internet at this oh, point. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, which is kind of inspiring that it's hard to defeat the internet. But then there's like bots there. I think if you're sophisticated, I'm not sure that's true. But if you're not, it's kind of remarkable they haven't been able to capitalize on these bot armies because there's one thing that they have. It's a lot of tax free money that they got nothing else better to do with. Yeah, right. So, you can invest. You know, they just, they should give you a call. Like they just don't have the right people, apparently. <laughs> uh, but that said, how do they wield uh, influence with government agencies? With You've talked about uh, the, the local police. Yeah. Uh, enforcement, uh, also federal agencies, anything. That is the one way they effectively put their money to use is lobbyists and attorneys, um, you know, judges. Very rarely have they ever, ever been able just to get a politician on their side. It's the behind the scenes people. You know, Greta Van Susteren is a very high level long-term Scientologist. And her husband, I always get it wrong. It's either Jim Cole or John Cole. I always get it wrong. Uh, he's a very powerful attorney who has a lot, uh, wields a lot of influence behind the scenes. And that's just one example. Like the reason why that's an interesting example is because he's actually a Scientologist and he travels in those circles. Scientology though, it's money goes to good use by hiring non-Scientologists, retired judges, attorneys, lobbyists. It really is how they get almost anything done. Like Miscavige himself is not hobnobbing and glad hanging and shaking hands and meeting these folks. It's the non-Scientologist professionals who work behind the scenes on Scientology's behalf. Can you describe the dynamics of that, how that actually happens? Like, like why, why, would the, why, why would the police department work on behalf of Scientology? I meant more the courts and the courts. regulators, not the police department. But well, for example, uh, it can come down to something as simple as this. Sci in Clearwater, Scientology hires Clearwater police to do off-duty work for them. Well, they pay like three times the normal off-duty rate. So they will, even though I'm not aware of anyone on the Clearwater PD who's actually a Scientologist, mm -hmm. they basically end up with, they would call them allies or safe points, Got it. right? People who like will literally operate as Scientology spies. You know, if someone comes in and follows a report about some child sex case, someone in the Clearwater PD is calling Sarah Heller at the Office of Special Affairs at the Flag Latin base to let her know, hey, heads up. We got a thing coming in and then Scientology can run around and go talk to all the Scientologists who have knowledge about this and either get them out of clear water, you know. So it's not like uh, direct explicit corruption, but more just uh, friends and coworkers yeah. integrated deeply in, in, the, in the community. Yeah, I call it soft corruption. So on, another example, you have um, the mayor of Clearwater, Frank Hibbard. Um, well, he used to, uh, when, when he, won his recent election, he stepped down from some of these nonprofits that he served on. Mm -hmm. But the nonprofits that he served on also gets millions of dollars of donations from some of Scientology's richest Clearwater members, mm -hmm. right? You have one of the mayor's best friends, Joe Burdett, literally a paid lobbyist for Scientology. Mm -hmm. So that creates a chilling effect on anyone who's gonna be talking smack about Scientology because his friends are on their damn payroll. Mm -hmm. So um, I call it soft corruption. It's not illegal. It's not illegal. Um, but it's how Scientology wields influence. And what's, what's, what's ironic is that a lot of these people who work on Scientology's behalf actually secretly hate Scientology. They kind of see through it, but it's part of the community. I mean, yeah. it's deeply integrated in the community and there's financial leverage. Um, are you ever afraid I mean, afraid for your well-being, afraid for your ability to function in society no. because of the pressures from Scientology. No, is that because you're genetically malfunctioning, or, <laughs> or mentally, or, or is is the, or is there speaking out as a kind of protection? I think it's one of those things that once you've seen behind the curtain, you see the Wizard of Oz is just a silly man. You just don't have any fear. Now it's one of these things like people say, "Oh, you're so brave," and I go, eh, "What's that quote? Bravery is." You know, being a soldier and being afraid and going in any way. Mm -hmm. It's not brave to run in if you don't think you're, nothing's gonna happen to you. Like, so I, I'm just trying to, like, I do not hold myself up as an example of bravery. Cause yeah. I, it's not like, oh, they could destroy me, but I don't care. No, there's not a damn thing they can do to me. And it's one of, that's one of the reasons I continue to put out content every day. To just basically go, hey, still here. 
<laughs> I dare you to try to do something about it, but you can't. And hope that that also serves as kind of an example for other people to go, if this schmo can do it yeah. and they can't do anything else to him, then maybe I can do it too. Because mm -hmm. I would love it. I would love there for be a 20 channels where former Scientologists talk about their experience. I mean, that is bravery because what happens is fear seeps in even if it's not grounded in reality. But at the same time, like, uh, you know, uh, my grandfather who uh, fought in, in World War II, I mean, the story is, I mean, he was very convinced and sure most of the people he fought alongside would died. He was a machine gunner. But he believed that bullets can't hit him, right? That's what he said. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, so <laughs> he was right, <laughs> right? Because he survived. So there's some sense, like Survivor you're biased. <laughs> that he's like just like you are. I was like, I'm not brave. I just the bullets can't hit me. <laughs> I mean, there, there's a dark kind of truth to that. There's some, you know, it's like a, it's it's a feedback loop where if you have the confidence and you push on forward and you're brave in that way to not let fear seep in and affect you, it actually gives you less things to be scared about. And yeah. I mean, but that initial few steps might be uh, for people, it might be a very difficult step to take to talk about it publicly. The fear was knowing how the family was gonna be destroyed and yeah. trying to prevent that. I was terrified of that happening. But it happened. There's nothing left to be afraid of. And that's kind of the thing. Like they created this beast. And the same is true for Mark Headley. The same is true for Mike Rinder. I, I said that they've essentially created a Scientology proof virus, Scientology resistant strain <laughs> by throwing everything they have at us yeah. for so many years. They have just <laughs> through natural selection created people who just do not give a damn about anything they could or would do. And maybe there is something a little wrong with me. Because when I get a phone call from someone like, I just got this phone call about you. And it's clear that it's Scientology PIs doing work behind the scenes. I get really excited. I get really excited. I don't get nervous. I'm like, oh, no, what's happening? I'm like, oh, yeah, this is going to be exciting. I'm like, okay. Because everything they try to do to me, I'm going to figure out how to reflect it back on them and make them look ridiculous. And that pales in comparison to the separating from family. Exactly. What is there? Is there parts of your family that you've lost because of Scientology? Just, yes. If you, most of my episode <clears throat> on the Lee Remini in the Aftermath show was talking about me and my twin brother. It's just a pretty horrible story. It's just a pretty horrible story. So I do have a younger brother who's still in Scientology and disconnected from me, but I never had much of a relationship um, with that brother, um, really, to begin with, right? Um, <clears throat> but my twin brother died when I was like 23 or 24. And that was, without any question, a direct result of um, our Scientology experience. You know, he died in a car accident that wasn't technically his fault or anything. Like he wasn't even the one driving. But uh, the fact, the, the specific fact of his death was not meaning like the, the, the fact and the manner of his death and time wasn't like specifically because of Scientology. But our story and how, uh, where our relationship got to and how he was even in a position of having something like that happen to him is directly attributable to Scientology. Do you think about him? Miss him? Is part of what you're doing in memory of him? Yeah, for sure. Man, this is such I mean, a... You know, we were identical twins. Can you imagine two of me? <laughs> <laughs> I can barely handle one. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Ugh. Losing him, would that be the darkest moment in this whole journey of Scientology for you? Two moments would equal the darkest moment. It it would be that, and also just the period of, you know, six, nine, 12 months of impending doom. Knowing that my wife's whole family was going to be obliterated and that there's nothing we could do about it. And uh, and kind of telling ourselves every step of the way it wasn't really going to happen, you know. 
<clears throat> and I really felt like, you ever watch the Ozarks? Mm -hmm. I felt like Marty Bird. Now, this was happening before the Ozarks, but when I watch the Ozarks and I see that character, the entire world is crumbling down around him and all he can, all he did like, all right, what's the next step? I watch Marty Bird and I go, that's my fucking spirit animal. <laughs> because you can only control what you can control. Yeah. And um, you can't keep Scientology from destroying your family. And and literally, like, I, I it's funny. I've, I mentioned this show a lot because I watched that and I go like, that's exactly how I felt. You know, I talk about this six months or nine, 12 months, whatever it was of, of impending doom. It's not like I was an emotional wreck during that time. You know, in private I was, but it's not like I was just freaking out. It was like, the sun's going to come up tomorrow. The world's going to keep spinning. I can't control it. This is hard. I can't believe this is happening. But tomorrow's a new day. Um. I've never personally, even at the darkest times, I've never experienced anything that I would characterize as depression, certainly not ever any suicidal thoughts or anything. And even in the darkest of times, I and again, this one thing I go, is it because of Scientology or is it just me? There really is an emotional detachment. There almost has to be. And it's a cold calculation. What, what are my options? What do yeah. I do here? And then once I figure out the answer to that question, I'm actually quite chipper and happy. You know, like that's sort of my default. Like you could give me six horrible options. Once I figure out the best of those six, I'm going to feel like I just had a pretty good day. That's brilliant. Because uh, I, I just watching Ozarks is so stressful. It is, right? It's so stressful watching it. Is it <laughs> and uh, he usually finds a way. And usually it is a set of really bad options. And it's one of the bad options, <laughs> but it's the best of the bad options. And he almost gets pissed off at everyone around him for being so pouty about it. <laughs> oh, but no, you know, watch it's, that show again, the same way again. <laughs> oh, that's but you know, beautiful. it's like you know, it's still simmering there, right under the surface, like pretty damn close to the surface. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And um, people sometimes ask about recovery and whatnot, and like, what does that look like, and what does that mean? And this sort of goes back to kind of the emotional detachment. Is I go, what the fuck does recovery even mean? Yeah. If you're an alcoholic and you're recovering, you know what that means. I used to drink. I don't drink now. Well, I used to be in a cult and I'm not in a cult now. How else am I supposed to feel about this for someone to be like, it seems like you've recovered. What the fuck does that even mean? Like, I, I'm sure some academic has an answer to that question. I'm not someone who particularly, I don't spend any time thinking about that. My recovery is success and a little bit of trolling and revenge, yeah. but mostly success, yeah. you know? What does it mean to be a recovered former cult member? What, you don't cry when people ask you about your brother? I don't know what it means. Yeah. Um, I've never had therapy, but not because I'm still like against it from Scientology. I just like, I'm not gonna pay to talk to someone. <laughs> do you know where else I could do that? Scientology. Yeah. Now, I, I know there's a lot of people going like, oh boy, he, I know there's a lot, I'm not shitting on therapy. I would rather have a beer with my friend and talk about this shit yeah. than talk to a professional for $200 an hour. That's a kind of therapy, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, listen, that's uh, <laughs> part of the reason I do this podcast. It's uh, talking to people that you care about, that, that you're close with, it's a really powerful, powerful thing. But yeah, I don't know what recovery looks like. And success to you is defined, just be, find happiness. Find happiness outside the closed bubble that defines what happiness yeah. looks like, a Scientology. If I can make my kids happy, that's success to me.